here we go. The last day of Revelation, a story of hope. I know it's been maybe a little bit longer series than some of the other ones that we've done. But uh, I, I know it's been encouraging for myself to dig back into Revelation again and dig back into the word as to our eternal future and what's in store for our lives. And uh, just to recap, the first part of this series, we looked at the seven churches in chapters two and three, which were Jesus wrote to these seven specific churches through his apostle John. But they're also representing the churches within the church age, which is us. And then out of that, we looked at the rapture. And the marriage supper of the Lamb after that. And then we looked at the seven years of tribulation and all the judgments that will be taking place on the earth during that point. And then we looked at last week, the second coming of Christ and and, and really the, the marriage supper of the Lamb and the millennial reign of Christ here on earth for a thousand years that we will reign with Jesus during that time. And so today we're going to finish the book of Revelation in chapters 21 and 22. Now, Revelation 21 reveals the eternal future God has planned for his people, which is the ultimate purpose that God had for the human race back from the beginning at creation. And finally, it's going to take place one day, and then we're going to read about it here in chapters 21 and 22. And John says this in 21 verses 1 through 8. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them forever. This will be his people, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, which is the second death. And so the clear theme out of these verses is this. God will make everything new. God is going to make everything new one day. And we see there are many things, new things coming for eternity. But with these new things coming will be the destruction of existing things. Three destructions of the earth are described in the Bible. One is already passed and two are yet to come or to take place. The first destruction was through the flood in the days of Noah sparing only eight righteous persons, according to what the Bible says, which included Noah and his wife, their three sons, and each of their wives. And Scripture talks about the destruction of the earth in regards to the day of the Lord's wrath, which we already looked at in Revelation chapter 16, when God pours out his seven bowls of wrath on the earth, just before the second coming and just before the millennial reign of Jesus. Jesus said himself, even in Matthew 24, 35, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Meaning all of this is temporary. This is all going to go away. It's all going to be destroyed. As beautiful as the earth is and some of the scenery, it's all going to be destroyed one day. And only God can destroy it because he's the one that created it. Which means for us, the church, that We cannot get caught up in this life. All this is temporary. And we can miss out on eternity and the eternal focus that God wants us to have if we get caught up here and now. God will destroy the existing to make a new. And here is some of what will will be new according to what we see in this passage. The first thing is a new heaven. John says in verse 1, the first heaven and earth will pass away and no 
longer will there be any seas, no more oceans. Now, first thing I want to look at is why will God destroy the heaven? It's because the atmospheric heavens are filled with evil. Whenever we read about heaven in the Bible, there are three heavens. The first heaven is the atmospheric heavens around the earth, which we can see with our human eye. Everything that we can see up in the sky, as far as what we can see. The second heaven is where Satan and demons rule as the prince of the air, as scripture tells us. And then the third heaven is where the throne of God is located. And the apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the powers of this dark world, referring to Satan and his emissaries, are at work in the heavenly realms doing evil. So after the final rebellion of Satan, God will destroy the earth and all that has been marred and cursed by Satan's evil, including the atmospheric heaven. That's why he has to destroy the heaven. With this, there will be a new earth. The Bible does not tell us if the new earth will be limited to the 25,000 miles in circumference or the 8,000 miles in diameter of the present earth that we are living on. It may be much larger than this earth, but the Bible does not tell us. We're going to have to wait to find out in that day. But one thing is for certain is that the new earth will be our heaven. It's going to be the Christian's heaven. And when Christians talk about now going to heaven, they're referring to the soul state if they die before the rapture. After the resurrection of the body, believers will come to earth to reign with Christ during the millennium as we've already covered. And then after the thousand-year reign with Christ, we will live forever on the new earth described here in Revelation. And again, we see here that there there will not be any seas, there won't be any oceans on the new earth. Well, maybe we're wondering why are there not going to be any seas? One reason is, is there will be no seas because seas cause separation. Literal seas separate nation from nation as we see it here and now. And in the new creation, we will all be in close fellowship with one another and with God. Seas are also symbolic in the book of Revelation of evil, danger, and distress. And God will eradicate all evil, including Satan himself, we know and have already talked about in the final judgment. And then we also see here the new Jerusalem, which will be the bride of Christ. This holy city is what Jesus went back to heaven to prepare for his saints. He's preparing it now. Even today, it will come down from heaven to the new earth and is described further in this chapter. But it will be a city of righteousness prepared by God for the enjoyment of his people. And the expression used in verse 2, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, is a symbolic reference to the preparation of a virtuous young woman for the day of her marriage. And so the bride of Christ which God has been preparing for over 2,000 years now, will be the new Jerusalem. You tracking with me? It's not just a city, but rather a people-filled city where believers in their resurrected bodies will dwell after the millennium with Christ for all of eternity. If you really think about it, a city is more than just the buildings and streets as they are just the means for the inhabitants that compose the real city. But the new Jerusalem will be the capital of the eternal order of God, which is the bride, the wife of the Lamb, or the wife of Christ, the holy city, Jerusalem. And then we see in verse 5 that it will also, there will also be new things. New things. The Bible doesn't give us any info on what these new things may be, but God promises to create new things for an, an entirely new way of life for his people. He will create for us a dimension that we cannot even comprehend at this point. Our minds cannot comprehend how good, how awesome, how amazing it will be. And so God doesn't give us those types of details of all that he's planning, all that he has in preparation for us, because we probably couldn't handle it. And we would mess it up because we like to mess a lot of things up, right? God's made it simple for us in his word. And so he gives us a certain amount of information that we know here and now in order to see him face to face. But it's going to be awesome. It's going to be good. I hope you're getting excited about it. Okay. I get excited about this stuff because I'm like, man, I'm tired of this earth. I don't know about you. Jesus, come back today. He couldn't come back soon enough if it were today, right? But in God's timing. In God's timing. 
And one thing we know for sure from Scripture that will be different is that we will not be married in heaven as Jesus clarified in Matthew 22, verse 30. So if you're sitting next to your spouse, say, oh, honey, I'm sorry. We're not going to be married in heaven. I love you. And maybe some of you, well, I won't even go there. But whatever remorse we may feel when we think of eternity without marriage can easily be offset by faith when we accept the fact that all things will be new. Everything's going to be new. And we'll be living in unending joy and delight in our eternal future. And then we see through verses 1 through 5 here that it's going to be a new paradise. It's going to be a new paradise. In this new paradise, there will be no more tears. No more death. No more mourning. No more crying. No more pain because of the old order of things will be gone and God will have a new way of life for us for all of eternity. This new heaven and this new earth will be perfect. It will have no sin, no evil, and no temptation within it. It will be pure paradise for the rest of eternity. And the best of all that we see here is that it'll be a new place for God's throne. It's going to be a new place for God's throne. Verse 3 tells us that from then on, God will dwell with men. He will dwell with us, with mankind. God will live with us personally. He's going to move his headquarters to the new earth and will literally take up his abode in the new Jerusalem. And now we can't even fully comprehend the significance of living in an economy where God himself exists with us. Our minds can't even comprehend that. But we will be with him and he will be our God. And this includes includes those who voluntarily receive Christ by faith before the flood before Abraham, before Christ, during the church age and throughout the tribulation and the millennium. And this will be a place for all eternity where we can enjoy unbroken fellowship with God. And then verse 8 tells us the reality fact that all who reject Christ and choose to live in sin will experience the second death, which is separation from Christ in the fiery lake of hell. John goes on in Chapter 21, verses 9 through 14 to say, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And it shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now we see the number 12 is used here frequently within these verses to describe the new Jerusalem. And in the Bible, there's a lot of significance to numbers. God uses numbers as a significant meaning. And so it appears here that the 12 appears to be the governmental or administrative number. We find multiples of 12 in the administration of God's universe. We know from Scripture and even in Revelation that there's 24 thrones around the altar of God. Multiples of 12. There's also 144,000 outstanding believers who will probably gain special leadership positions in the millennial kingdom because of their witness for Christ during the tribulation. We also see here God's glory and brilliance from his presence within the holy city. As we see, John says, says it's like a jasper. It's clear as crystal, which is, speaks to the purity of Christ's bride. And then he describes the city as a high wall with 12 gates. These are 12 entrances that will always be open for God's people to have access to the new Jerusalem. There will be three gates on each of the four sides of this gigantic city. Now, if there's gates, that means that we can come and go within that city. Then we see here as a description, there are 12 angels at the gates. And this reveals, again, the relationship of the angels in the eternal order and their work with the human race. 
The names of the 12 tribes of Israel are written, it says, on the 12 gates, and these indicate the children of Israel will have access to this heavenly city. There are 12 foundations to the walls of this city. And in verses 19 through 21, they're described as being decorated with every kind of precious stone. And these foundations contain the names of the 12 apostles, indicating the new Jerusalem will contain the redeemed by the blood of Christ, which is us, who heard the gospel through the faithful witnessing of the servants of God in the first century through the apostles. And so the gates of this city contain the names of the 12 tribes, indicating that they were the vehicles through which the oracles of God were revealed in the Old Testament and to whom Messiah came. Both Old Testament saints and the church will have access to this city, though. But each time we enter, we will be reminded of our debt to the nation of Israel and to the apostles of sharing and preaching the gospel. John continues on in Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 21, to say, The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. And the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold as pure as transparent glass. Man, it just makes me excited just to read that. How awesome it's going to be. And we see a few things out of these verses And the first is in regards to the size of heaven. Now, we see that measurement there, 12,000 stadia, but and we don't typically measure things in our life by stadia, but the 12,000 stadia that's used here is approximately 1,400 miles in length. So the city will be 1,400 miles in length and width and then in height on each side. In essence, it's cube shape. Now, to put it into context, the size of this city within the United States, it would stretch from the eastern seaboard of our coast on the east to the Mississippi River, and then from the Canadian border all the way down to the Gulf Coast. That's how large, approximately, this city will be on that day. A city. I didn't say a nation or country. A city. Come on now. Are you with me? That's large. It's going to be awesome. And then on top of that, it's going to be the same height, 1,400 miles high. Now, again, I don't know that we can fully comprehend, like, okay, right now we have sky, so we see sky, but like 1,400 miles high, wow. Okay, God, you're good. And then it says the walls of this city are 144 cubits thick, which is about 200 feet. So it's going to have thick walls, which always signifies power, authority, and greatness. And so this city will be massive, not to mention the rest of the new earth that God has created. This is just a part of heaven. There's other parts that we're not going to fully know yet. This is just a city. We also see the substance of heaven here. Think about it. The materials God will use for heaven will not be of cinder blocks or shag carpet or particle board doors. He will only use the best materials. Nothing on earth will compare to the materials of heaven and what God's going to use. And here we see the walls of jasper or diamonds. The city will be made of pure gold to see through as pure as glass, the Bible tells us. The foundations are made of all these beautiful precious stones listed in verses 19 and 20. And the 12 gates are made of 12 solid pearls. Come on, we can't even comprehend the size of a pearl. This isn't just a small gate. It's going to be a large gate, 12 of them, of solid pearls. And then the streets are made of pure gold. And then we see the sanctity of heaven. This refers to the holiness and separation of heaven. Heaven will be a sanctified place where no evil 
will ever be present. And the list of those excluded from heaven is found three times in the final two chapters of Revelation. In chapters 21, verse 8, as well as 27, and then as well as chapter 22, verse 15. And God is so clear in his word, even in these couple chapters, as that not everyone will be there. Sometimes people think on this earth that everyone's going to be in heaven. And some may have greater place in heaven than others, but not everybody's going to be there, according to what God tells us. And that's why we have to make sure that our lives, our hearts, remain in a right place with God. But that we share the gospel with the world around us. So that they end up going to heaven as well. We see this in the upcoming verses in 22 to 27 where John says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so John tells us there is no need for a temple. Finally, there will no longer need be a need for a physical building or a temple because from the beginning of creation, God has chosen to fellowship with us. He walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He had fellowship. He had relationship with them. That was his intentions of what he wanted to do and how he wanted to operate with mankind. But after the fall, because of sin, a place of sacrifice had to be established. The temple in the Old Testament was where God dwelt in the midst of his people within the Holy of Holies. And then we know that Jesus came to be the final sacrifice for all sin. But when he left earth, he sent his Holy Spirit to live on the inside of us as our bodies are called the temple of the Holy Spirit within Scripture. So in the new Jerusalem or heaven, God the Father and Jesus are the temple. Are you tracking with me? Think about that for a moment. No longer do we have to go to a building. No longer do we have to come together like this within a building to worship God, but we can go directly to him out of relationship out of perfect relationship and fellowship with God, our creator. How awesome is that? We can go to him and just ask him questions, talk to him about anything, about our life here on earth, but about our eternal future. We can worship him. We can adore him. We can give him all that is worthy and is owed to him because of who he is. He's going to dwell with us. And with this, God is the light of the city. The Bible teaches us that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And therefore the sun or the moon will not be needed to shine on the city. God himself will provide sufficient light just by his presence. Jesus as the lamb will be the lamp of the city. And the nations or people from all nationalities will walk by God's light, it tells us. Think of it, no darkness forever. No darkness forever. All of you that don't like to sleep or you have a hard time going to sleep, good news. One day you won't have to. Then we see everyone in the Lamb's book of life will have access to the city. Only those who have their name written in the Lamb's book of life will have access to the holy city, the new Jerusalem. They will be able to come and go. Nothing impure will ever enter the city, or or in other words, no one who rejects Christ or who lives in the shame and deceit of sin here on earth. Whoever rejects Christ is not in the Lamb's book of life and will go to hell forever, never able to be a part of heaven. They will be eternally separated from God. Moving on to the final chapter of Revelation in the Bible, John says in verses 1 through 5 of Revelation 22, he says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. 
No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So this chapter contains a final description of this heaven-like earth that God has prepared for those who love him. That's us. And the first thing we see is the river of the water of life. This river is going to run right through the middle of the city, and it will be as clear as crystal, it says. In our current life here and now, we can't live without water. And we see here that water will still be a part of this city. And it's referencing, it's referencing Ezekiel 47, verse 1, as well as Joel chapter 3, verse 18, because we know that in both the Old and New Testaments, water is associated with the salvation of God and the life-imparting and cleansing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so this pure water or river comes from the throne of God as God will be at the center of the city. He's going to be at the center of our lives. He's going to be at the center of all of eternity. And in the eternal paradise God has planned for us, an abundance of water will proceed from God as he will be our life-giving source. Everything we need right from him. Perfect union, perfect fellowship, perfect everything. And then we see here the tree of life, and it says this tree will bear 12 crops of fruit monthly. Well, that's a lot of fruit every single month to bear. How large must this, this tree be for all of those who will be in heaven will be able to partake of it? The last time we saw this tree was in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had sinned against God, he forbade them to eat of this tree. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, it states that if they ate from this tree, that they would be able to live forever. And so now that we will be in heaven with God for all of eternity, we will be able to eat of the tree of life because we will have no sin and will have eternal life. And the leaves of this tree, it says, will be the healing of the nations, or rather for the health of the nations, as we know that there's not going to be any sickness in heaven. And this is stating here that there will be healing in the relationship between nations or between people, and we will live with equality and living fairly with one another in all justice in God's perfection. And after all that we have experienced here on earth in regards to the racial divide, we will finally, finally live in wholeness as God intended for people from all nations. Finally, perfect unity. Finally, perfect love in that moment. And I want to encourage us as awesome as that it's going to be in that day that we the church here and now live like we're supposed to live according to the way it's going to be in heaven. That we love all people. And we go out of our way to love people, even those who are different from us. Because heaven is going to have different ethnicities. People from all different kinds of nations, people from all over around the world the Bible tells us. It's going to be awesome. And then we see here, we will also be no longer under any curse once and for all. The curse that God placed on the earth as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve will partially be lifted during the millennium, but completely lifted for the rest of eternity. Therefore, the unlimited potential God gave to the human race will be realized for the first time. Let that sink in. We've not reached our full potential with God because of sin. Sin held us back, but thanks be to God, he provided a way so that we could have forgiveness of sin and have eternal life through Jesus. And on that day, in that moment for all of eternity, we're going to have the full potential, unlimited potential, all the limits taken off of our lives to be able to do whatever God has in store for our lives, things that we can't even comprehend yet here and now on this earth. Am I the only one excited? Come on now. That's okay to say amen at that. Like, that's good news. God saved the best for last at the end of the book and at the end of the Bible. And as proof that it will be an uncursed earth, God will place his throne there, right in the middle. His angelic hosts and human beings will be with him as servants. No rebellious servants of God will exist in the eternal order. And then we also see here that we will see God's face and his name will be on our forehead. 
We will finally be able to see God's face because our glorified bodies will be able, capable, capable of doing so. Up until this point, no man has been able to ever see God with human bodies or human eyes and live. And God's name will be written on our foreheads, which will be the seal of God, indicating we are the blood-bought children of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. God's going to seal us and say, you're mine for all of eternity. And then again, as we already mentioned, there will be no more night. God will give us light all the time and there will not be any night time. No more sleeping. Our bodies will not need to recoup every day. We won't need the sun or the heat or the light as we will depend on the Lord to provide a consistent pattern of light which will be ideally suited for our glorified bodies. And then finally, we see we will reign with Christ forever. We're going to reign with Christ forever. Just as we rule with Christ for a thousand years during the millennial age, so we're going to reign with him forever. Now, whether that involves universes, galaxies, and other planets, we don't fully know. But one thing is for certain, we will be in perfect relationship and will rule with him for all of eternity. And in verse 6, the angel tells John then, these words that I've just given you are trustworthy and true to reveal what must take place or what will happen in that time. In verse 7, Jesus says then, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy written in this scroll or book. And then in verses 10 and 11, John was told not to seal or keep the hidden or keep hidden the words of this prophecy because the time is near. In other words, God wants us to know what's coming. He wants us to know and to be ready for Christ's return for the rapture, but also for our eternal life to know what's coming. If you recall Daniel, when Daniel had a prophecy about the end time, God said to seal up that scroll, to seal up that prophecy until the right time. But here, God's saying, no, I want people to know what's coming. I want them to know about their eternal future. And then it says there, God says, let the person who does what's wrong or is vile keep on doing so, and let the person who does what's right or what is holy continue to do so as well. Meaning, Christ is coming back soon, so make a choice. Whose side are you on? Which side are you on? And then we see Jesus say this in verses 12 through 19. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. In in essence, lying. In quotes, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty, come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. So Jesus closes his book reminding us of who he is and that he's coming soon. In other words, this is what we see here. Jesus invites everyone to receive eternal life and for the church to invite others to come to be a part, to not miss out on heaven. We need to be ready for his return as the church, as the body of Christ. We've already talked about that. And Jesus makes it very clear within scripture about who will not make it into heaven. We cannot be deceived about who will not be there. If we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we wash our robes because we're cleansed with the blood of Christ, which was sacrificed for us, And it gives us the right to eternal life in the new Jerusalem and to the tree of life. And if we don't accept Christ, then we are stuck in our sin. Scripture is very clear about that. And Jesus is giving this invitation of salvation one last time at the end of Revelation because of 
what we can expect to come in the last days and for all eternity. And so he says, come, take the free gift of the water of life. And it's free to us because Christ is the one who paid the price with his life for us. And John says here, the spirit of God and the bride are saying, come, receive salvation. Don't hesitate, don't wait, but come. And Jesus is saying for the church or the bride of Christ to invite others to salvation. Church, I want to remind us that he's placed us here on earth to be the salt of the earth, to be the light, to speak truth, to let others know of God's love and the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do so that they would not miss out on eternity. What a shame it would be if we do not share the love and the gospel truth of who Christ is with the world around us. And we will be held accountable for not sharing when we stand before Jesus. And we see here that John told us in Revelation chapter 1, if you think back to chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, that we're blessed, or in the Greek, that word means happy. When we read this book, when we read Revelation, when we hear and understand the book, and then we keep or do the things within this book. In essence, we will be blessed. We will live a happy or life or live in joy because of being obedient to God through the book of Revelation. And since God is telling us to read Revelation, to understand and to hear it, and then to do what's in this book, then it must be readable, understandable, and doable throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation has so many prophecies about the future, things that will happen, but we don't know fully about yet. But we cannot do the future. We can only do the present. We've got to be obedient here and now is what this book is telling us. And so the main focus of Revelation is not to give us an unclear plan that we have to try to figure out everything and how it's going to be in the future for all of eternity. Rather, the focus is for us to see what we should do now here in the present is what John was trying to say at the beginning of chapter 1. And that's why John said this book would then be a blessing to us if we put it into practice now or if we obey what it tells us. And we will not only be blessed here and now in this life, but in the eternal life when Jesus rewards us as we see him face to face one day. And so as a church, we need to be obedient to Christ in our lives and to share the gospel with the world around us. And in essence, Revelation is really simple if you break it down. It's about being a faithful servant of Christ and living in obedience will bring great happiness because it's a story of hope. It's really a story of hope. And this happiness is something that will last forever and cannot be taken away by anyone, including Satan himself, because it's joy that only Christ can bring our lives. The last thing I want us to see is that God warns of judgment to all who would add or take away from his word. John makes it clear that God will bring judgment to anyone who adds to this prophecy or who takes away from it. If they add words to the prophecy to expand it, then God will add plagues described in this prophecy that take place during the seven-year tribulation, and those were not very pretty. They were not fun. If they take away words, then he will take away from that person their share in the tree of life and of the holy city that we talked about. And Jesus testifies to this by saying, I am coming soon. Church, if we, if we really look at it, this is one of the most awesome challenges in the Bible against tampering with God's word. Many ridicule or detract from, take away from, and talk despairingly about God's word. And those who do so may not see judgment today, but in God's timing, he will bring swift justice to their lives. Understand, it's a fearful thing to disbelieve God. We have to guard ourselves as believers, as Christians, from disbelief in who God is and what his word tells us. We have to trust him in everything that he says in here to not take away certain things or to not pick and choose certain things, but to believe all of what's in here to the completion of who God is and what he's communicated to us through his word. 
And through unbelief, one detracts from his word. We take away when we don't believe God at his word. And so it's a challenge for those who also preach and teach not to leave the book of Revelation left to the side. It's also a challenge for all of us to remember and honor God's word as the final rule of authority as it rules and governs our lives. All of God's word is truth and will come to pass. It will come to pass. And so my challenge for us is this. We must read God's word. We have to hear and understand what God is trying to communicate to us. And then we have to apply it and do it as God's servants. Because it's a story of hope. It is a story of hope. God is so faithful. He's so good. He has amazing things in store for every one of our lives for all of eternity. Amen? Do you believe it? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you that, God, you've already got our future planned out, and it is awesome. We can't even comprehend how awesome it is. Lord, I pray that we would continue while we're here and now on this earth until we get to see you face to face. I pray that we would continue to be faithful and to guard ourselves from any type of unbelief from your word and what you communicate to us and lead us. Lord, I pray that we would take you without even hesitation to trust you completely in everything. I pray that we would read your word. We would hear and understand what it says and then we would apply it and do it because we will live the blessed life that you want us to live here and now on this earth until we see you face to face. God, you are so good and so faithful. Lord, I just pray that we, the church, would also share your love with the world around us. I pray that we would share truth, that we would share the gospel message clearly about who Jesus is. Lord, that we would give opportunities for people to see who you are and to accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, I pray for a fresh outpouring of boldness and confidence in our lives as believers, even in this day in which we live. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for placing us here, and we thank you for the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen.